Aloha, it's Dave Lawrence, and we're here at Hawaii Public Radio in uh, Studio 7, Control Room 7, better known as CR7 at the station. And it's right before Glenn Phillips of Toad the Wood Sprocket is about to play at the Atherton, and he joins me here in the studio. Aloha and mahalo. Thanks for being here. Aloha. I appreciate Thank having you. you. And, and how's your, uh, you've been here a few days. Uh, has any, any initial impressions of this return to Hawaii? Uh, so far, it's just been chill. It's uh I, I had no no agenda and nobody to see, so it was a lot of walking, a lot of running, and a lot of eating. Uh, <laughs> so it's been kind of perfect. I'm getting getting as much food in as I can. <laughs> and that's cool before we start. <laughs> Trying to burn it off as much as possible. Before we started the interview, uh, Glenn was talking about his, uh, some of his his, few, his food likes that he's been able to satisfy here, here in the area. Plus, we had a little inclement weather, which hopefully will go away uh, towards the rest of your Hawaiian stay. Uh, your other visits that are coming up you have have you hooked up with your family member yet who's you don't you have like cousin or something here yeah he uh my uh my cousin dick uh was uh we we got to go out and have some lunch today and good to see him and and debbie and he uh he was a infectious diseases and internal medicine doctor out here and um leprosy expert wow cool stuff fitting for hawaii there you go <laughs> no, no doubt about that so you this this visit comes on the heels i guess of uh all you want which a lot of artists at, at different points in their career kind of go back over some of their biggest songs i mean not a lot of people a handful of artists and they revisit them mm -hmm. um, particularly if they don't own the original masters <laughs> that seems to be the deciding factor is that really do you think the, uh, oh yeah i mean because uh you know most contracts if we were to try to buy back our records um from Sony, they would probably ask for a million dollars. Um, and if I had a million dollars, I would do something else with it. Wow. Uh, and so instead, we spent about a thousand dollars and we re recorded them and recorded it and mixed it ourselves and, uh, you know, hired a couple of other musicians and a mastering engineer and uh, made our own version of our greatest hits. Was so. it to make a greatest hits, or w what was the motivation to do it? I mean, the original motivation was straight out business, was, um, you know, for, for, like, placement. If somebody wants to use it in a film uh, and it. they call up Sony, it takes a long time. There's a lot of lawyers. It costs more than they want to afford, and then they don't use it, whereas if they come to us... Uh, we can be quicker and cheaper and, and make more of the money at the and, end. And actually get the songs used. It's just, it's one of those things. And Sony isn't evil or bad. They're just huge. And we're low on the priority list. So they toss out a standard quote and it's more than we can get these days. And so um, this just lets us own some part of, you know, what we've done. I mean, and so, I mean, that was the impetus to do it. But getting back in the studio, we hadn't recorded together in, you know, 15 years or something. And so it was a very mellow way to get back and test the waters of how we work together again. Um, and uh, and re-examined some of the songs or kind of rearranged new tempos. Um, you know, it was really fun to take this stuff back and kind of look at how we did it, take it apart, and, and do it again. <laughs> sure. So, And when you talk about that, that's sort, certainly one of the things that for on the fan end of, of w what we've been talking about, when an artist re-records stuff, it's, it can be often rewarding because the arrangements may be a little different. It may reflect mm -hmm. some of where the artist has been. One of the things that you have gotten to do in between when those songs were recorded and now and re-recorded, you got to work with one of music's most legendary bassists, multi-instrumentalist, keyboardist, and arranger, John Paul Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, and not a lot of people get that experience. And I'm hoping that you can kind of just go through your mind a little bit and share with the rest of us, you know, us lower people on Earth, how'd you get that chance? You're kind of a Zeppelin fan, aren't I, you? I have it. I have it in me. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was really random, and I actually felt pretty unworthy. He was a, um, a big Nickel Creek fan, and he'd gone out to Merle Fest, this uh, bluegrass festival, right hung out with them and he, he he plays mandolin and was just in love with Chris Thiele's playing because of course who isn't uh, and so he we needed a bass player for this tour and just we just had to ask because they just met him and it, it was it just seemed like the silliest possible thing and we, we figured he would say no and instead he said yes and ended up going on the road with us for a few weeks and um, so it was a completely random deal. And I mean, the great thing about him is that he has the right 
I don't know if anyone has the right to, no one actually does have the right to be a jerk, but you wouldn't be shocked if he was, or if he was full of himself, or, he, you know, if he was too big for the room. Right. And, um, I mean, he, he mentioned at one point that we were the first bus tour that he'd, uh, I think the second bus tour he'd ever been on in the United States. Because um, <laughs> they flew everywhere. Because they flew everywhere. He'd never actually just gone in a bus. And, you know, for me, it was luxury to be back in a bus. I mostly tour in a compact car. And so I was I was thinking, <laughs> this is luxury. And he was just a total kind of sport. You know, we're staying at Holiday Inns. And... Um, you were throwing any any TVs out of the room? No, it was it was really mellow. I mean, the first night we had actually was was Seattle, so he told us Edgewater <laughs> stories. Uh, but I mean, the great thing was, as a musician, he was completely present tense, and uh, he, you know, such an active listener, such a lover of music. And I mean, we we had a day where he pulled into New York, and uh, you know, there was a. I just mentioned that there happened to be a sheet music store and, you know, the Nickel Creek and him run off and, you know, come back an hour later with, you know, just stacks like half a foot high of all these scores they bought and they're just passing them around and marking things. And I mean, they're, and, you know, he's, you know, same as Nickel Creek, just um, so actively in love with music still. That's why he does it. You know, he doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to do. And he... You know, he ended up after that producing Sarah's solo record, and um, he's a really cool guy. Yeah, he, uh, I saw him solo one time, and I was very fortunate. I had a listener who who gave me the chance to buy her extra ticket to the Zeppelin reunion, and I actually saw that show mm -hmm. in '07 at the O2, and just curious if there was a thing getting to be around a guy who can arrange and has that kind of knack to um, make songs into something. Is there anything you learned from your time with him that y you've come away from? Like, man, I picked that up from John Paul Jones. Because of, I mean, the thing was, he came out and he wasn't terribly rehearsed. You know, we had to re rehearse and get the show up really quickly. And so we didn't do a lot of taking apart of the songs. Um, he hadn't played on the record, so it was learning a whole bunch of songs and then going and playing a whole bunch of shows. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and, you know, there's subtle things you pick up as far as pocket and as far as listen. You know, he's an incredibly active listener, um, but we weren't. So maybe that's something you got. From yeah, we weren't in a production. I have a feeling Sarah could tell you a lot more sure. about about what he brings in. But I mean, he's he's an incredibly musical guy. I mean, um, and, and even I, I ended up in London with my family for a while, and I had one tiny little show, and I I'd, I'd called him up. It was in. in intent on not telling him I was playing because I didn't want to be that guy at all. And he ended up, you know, it's like, well, you're, play you're playing a show here, aren't you? Are, you? are you doing something here? It's like, well, just with the family. Well, you know, eventually told him I was playing this little show and he's like, could I bring my mandolin? Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, just, um, and ended up, you know, just showing up and playing along on a bunch of songs. And you kind of, so, do you ever look over when he was doing that and be like, man, that's the Battle of Evermore, right? That there. was really trippy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was I, really trippy. I can imagine. A few of the songs, I just wanted you to take us through them personally, uh, just while I had you here. Uh, and just your recollection on the lyrical inspiration for them and anything that comes to mind about the recording of them. Some of them have really become uh, their standards on the radio. You know, the classic alternative format has made these songs uh, radio standards. I hear them all the time when I'm shopping at the Waikiki Shopping Plaza. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, something's always wrong. Uh, a brilliant introduction. I mean, sonically, if you can talk a little bit about where any of that came from. Um, where did that come from? Todd actually wrote... A lot of the music on that, um, we would kind of throw things back and forth. Sometimes he'd have music, I'd throw in lyrics, uh, sometimes I'd add parts in, and so I think the counter melody stuff and the kind of bridge oriented parts I threw in, but um, he just had, you know, that, that basic melody in that music and the one line, something's always wrong, he kept singing at the end of, and so I just kind of wrote around that one phrase. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a it's a general mishmash, more of a feeling piece. It's I, I mean, I usually I'm not one of those guys who tends to have a single story and yeah, I write yeah. a song about no, that. Sure. Um, it's I just good to like hear your to write. Yeah, I like to write vaguely enough <laughs> that <laughs> I, I like to write specifically as far as tone and emotion go, 
and fairly vaguely as far as plot lines go. So you can put yourself right into the end. Yeah, just because I figure it's about a series of feelings, and, and they can be, you know, in the way of, well, the song's about what the song's about. <laughs> it's harder for me to take it apart. I mean, um, but uh, the, uh, you know, the constant general unsettlement of most people, especially in terms of their relations with each other and, you know, the internal dialogue where you're always kind of uh, parsing everything somebody says and adding your own Is it usually irrelevant too? commentary to it. S- oh, it's it's always self-critical. <laughs> so, as much self-critical as anything else. Self-critical is kind of my specialty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just figured, I, I figured as much with that. Um, Although uh, the one thing I'm proud of in that song, uh, I'm particularly proud of the, the the hidden, the semi-hidden collectives, the brace of hopes, and the pride of innocence. Uh, get it? It's collectives. Mm. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, fall down. It's the, probably the most rocking hit that you mm-hmm. had. Um, it maybe transcends genre, so to speak, in some ways. Uh, where where is it when you hear it today? Is there something that comes to mind that where where it all started? Yeah, I mean that one is a little more of a specific story. It was just kind of a you know friend of a friend when I was. I mean, I was so young when I was writing those songs. So I mean, that was probably. Um, Wow, that would have been written twenty years ago. N- more, because uh, I would have been eighteen, nineteen, probably nineteen at the time. Because um, it was about it, w- it was about a friend that was my ex girl friend of my ex girlfriends before I met my wife, and I met her when I was eighteen. So, <laughs> uh, so seventeen or eighteen. That's a long time ago. Amazing the enduring uh, quality of it. I guess. But just a, you know, when people, I mean, the key line in that one is is the tries to, tries to hold on to all the reputation she can't mend of of just somebody who's decided they're bad seed and and they're just gonna go with go it. all the way with it and <laughs> and the, the you know there's you know no no way out yeah no way out or no way to resist it but to just take on it's like you think I'm bad I'm gonna I'm gonna show you some about bad. <laughs> And um, show you bad like you've never seen. Yeah, and so uh, just you know, watching watching someone have you know, I think it was my first experience really watching someone push themselves as hard as they could that way. Uh, mm. And uh, you know, it was you know, it's a, it's a it's a big way to go out. Good thing is when you're young, you, you bounce. People seem to bounce back very well, very quickly. Well, this stuff has really become part of people's lives, and and as a sort of a uh, all, all I want as a final note, is there anything about that song that I mean, as a I, I I hear it today, I wonder, does it mean something? Does any do any of them have a different meaning today for you than they did? Um, when well, you think of that no, vagueness, because it's because yeah, once again, because they're they're vague enough. I mean, all I want, you know, is it sounds like a happier song than it is because it's basically about how quickly joy seems to evaporate yeah, it's a long I, I <laughs> yeah like a long so, um you know it, it's more about but I, I there i kept having this feeling when i was young that there should be some you know continuity to ecstasy that at some point it wouldn't be dots it would be a line it wouldn't you know? go away yeah and and now it, it's kind of fine that you know that it's a little more pointillist <laughs> are, you ha- are you happier now um i'm more content I mean, uh, I'd say I'm less dramatic uh, and uh, less fatalistic. Um, Well, maybe not less fatalistic. Less concerned with personal drama and plot lines. Um, I, I, I I think the older you get, the more you realize that everybody kind of plays every character in every play. Uh, and uh-huh. we do them over and over, and and that it's kind of the way you play the character, and not necessarily the things you do. Uh, and you know, whether it's your close relationships, your work, yourself, like you're gonna do all those things. And so, um, it's the style that you do them with. 
Well, it's the style you do them with, and it's the kind of grace uh, that you forgive yourself and the people around you for their missteps, uh, or even if you think of them as missteps. I mean, it's just, it seems like we, you know, we do all the same stuff over and over, and, uh, you know, holding judgment over people for that, it, it, does, it doesn't seem like a very good use of time. Redemption's um, an important thing. Yeah, I suppose so. Or maybe it's not even redemption so much as it's process, which doesn't mean there isn't such a thing as maybe evil <laughs> or wrong, but um, means things are are more subtle, uh, have more reasons. You know, uh, there, there's always something more to look at. You know, when people talk about, you know, infidelity is a great one to pick out just because you look at infidelity and, you know, it's there's all kinds of shades Shades and questions of unhappiness, reasons what, you know, even questions about the assumptions people make about relationships and what they need to be or should be, and a lot of unspoken... Uh, nuance. Yeah, nuance. And so um, I just think there, there's... I don't know. People put down very, very uh, tight walls around their behavior, and it seems like the, the tighter those constraints are, the more they act out poorly when they act out. Mm. <laughs> and the more reasonably fluid those constraints are. And once again, if if perhaps tempered by some sense of morality and responsibility, meaning <laughs> it's not like Anton LaVey and you just, you know, anything is permissible at any time. You, you got to... Uh, you know, man up to the the feelings and thoughts of the people around you, but uh, that I think a more egalitarian society, a more open society, tends to uh, have better behavior. When you know, you, you know, there's a reason that um, that so many like you know fervently foaming at the mouth anti-gay preachers have been. Found, <laughs> found in a in a restroom. Found stall in a restroom somewhere. And if they could just be out, they wouldn't need to go to a restroom right. stall or an airport <laughs> for it. They could just love who they really loved, uh, you know. And so, I just I just think a, a little bit of openness goes a long way in in uh, in our behaviors. I like that. It's fitting from a guy who's wrote, written a lot of stuff that's that's really deep and, and offers a lot of, uh, like you said, it's vague. It's deep, but it's vague, and, and you're smart to do that. Uh, it allows it to be really useful for people. I really appreciate you taking a few moments for me before your big gig here, and I hope it's the, the first of several, if not many, appearances at HPR. And again, a big mahalo for taking me up on it. Thank you. It's a pleasure.